All right. So welcome. Um, we're we're stuck in the shadow. <laughs> I was going to teach three classes on this, but it just keeps going and going and going. So I think I'm going to uh, uh, make a course out of this too. So I'm taking clips from these classes and and I'm going to use those as supplementary for you know for, with written material for for a course. So it should be should be really good because getting lots of good feedback. These discussions are are just uh, very nice. Um, so the thing I want to talk about uh, this morning is um, I, one of the the biggest drivers in shadow. And and the thing that uh, keeps keeps parts of us hidden from ourselves is resentment, and so it's a it's a tender subject, you know. It's uh, it's a kind of thing that that we we can have, but not really be aware of it. Uh, we think of uh, think of somebody that uh, we have resentments towards, and uh, it immediately colors our view of them, and and constrains our ability to open up to them, you know, to even uh, receive anything they have to say. And so, I would like to just talk about it you know, to, to see how you all feel about that. And maybe if you can relate any, any instances where you've, you've discovered resentment in yourself and, and especially how you've dealt with it or, or if you've thought of dealing with it, you know, if it's something that, you know, do, do we even, do we even feel like anything can be done about it? You know, how do we, how do we, uh, not just counteract resentment, but but somehow, how do we integrate that? How do we how do we turn that into something good? Because it obviously just gets in our way in 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 just about every respect. So, what do you think? What do you go ahead and just speak up? Yeah. Well, in in my twelve step program. Um, First thing that we learn is that we cannot afford a resentment. Um, resentments lead us back out there. But um, there is something called a 14-day prayer. And if you have a resent, it's it's a tool that we use. If you have a resentment against someone, then for 14 days, pray for that person what it is that you yourself would like to have, whether you mean it or not. You just pray for that person as many times as you can for 14 days. And you may not mean it when you start it, but by the end, by the end of those 14 days, your heart's changed about it. Your feelings have changed about it. Um, and pretty much the resentment is taken away. So that's, that's, um that's one of the tools that, that that I actually use and that I recommend to you know, my sponsees too. That that's how it works for me. If I if I pray for the person, then and especially in just that way, um, mm -hmm. you know, and things like uh, you see them completely happy, you know, that like they have all the money they need. They they're in a great relationship. They're um, uh, they feel good about themselves and about their life, you know, all those good things to, um, uh, like you say, the things you would want for yourself. And, and it does, it has an alchemical effect. It's it, not it, easy, but you know, it works. Right. Right. I, I like, I relate. I'll, I'll jump in since we're on our panel here. Uh -huh. um, sure. I relate to what you said about <clears throat> having a resentment. Uh, again, somebody doesn't allow you to see or hear them communicate with them. And, and I, <clears throat> it doesn't allow 
when I have a resentment, it doesn't allow me to see what is or to be open to other possibilities. And I remember hearing, and I, I'm in the 12 step program as well. And early, as we say in the rooms, um, can't afford to have a resentment. Well, well, what is it? And I, I knew what the big ones were. Well, so-and-so said this to me, like, what did they mean by that? I don't, come on, you know, what, what are they thinking? And they've insulted me. And, and so I knew what some immediate resentments were and how it affected me. But what I didn't realize is how much my entire consciousness was affected by, I mean, I would be, I would find myself angry ongoing. And there came a point, I don't even know what I was angry about with some people. But behind all of that was a resentment. So as as we bring the light and focus on this, or as I did, you know, I would kind of say, wow, um, associate, well, I'm angry about something. If I know who it is, you know, then, it, you know, just started, start to bring the light in. But I think what I resonated with, as I said, was um, how it affects my, how a resentment affects my view of not only another person, but, um, reality inhibiting the ability to see what is and you know then it you start i start to see that national figures okay so let's let's take our our favorite our least favorite political figure you know the only impression i have of that person is how they're presented to us by the media and i could get work quite worked up about that presentation which then doesn't allow me to see what really is take it a step further i might dislike this figure i might have a a colleague a friend or a new acquaintance who likes him and ha sees you know likes their viewpoint but if i've got that resentment in a way we're not getting anywhere in a conversation right you know right relative to this yeah it's very counterproductive at that point um one more th another thing that's um again in in the book that goes along with our program and um and I find that this is common to many, many paths is if I've got a resentment towards somebody, I need to be looking at me. I need to look at what, you know, if, oh, that person's getting on my nerves because they're doing such and such, you know, and I have a resentment against them because they're doing this. Well, why is that? I need to look at myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of like a, uh... You know, get the mode out of your own eye before you, or the log out of your eye before you <laughs> try yeah. to pluck those. Or, beam or out well, of the other. you know, what I'm, what I'm think that I'm seeing in that person that's causing a resentment might not even be there. It's me. You know, there's something in me. Yeah, and I think that's our clue, Michael. I think what we're talking about that's our clue. Those things bubble up from our soul to show us. I think it's out there. I think it's in them, and they're affecting me. But it's not. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I've actually thought that um, even a person who commits murder uh, mm. who is like a uh, is like they're trying to get rid of something in themselves, and and in their insanity, they project it outward, and and take it out on someone else, like the scapegoat thinking that if they kill that person, they're going to kill the problem they're struggling with. You know, especially in, in uh, crimes of, uh, you know, that come out of stalking and uh, where you're dealing with a stranger, you know. And 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 if uh, someone uh, commits robbery, you know, they, they might project onto the person that somehow they stole that the money that 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 they're trying to get from the person, uh, they stole it from them anyway, you know, and that justifies robbing them. You know, kind of like a Robin Hood uh, character. So, so yeah, yeah. One thing I found that, um, and this happened just recently, uh, confession time. Um, so I was, I, I had this, uh, what I knew in the moment was a, a very significant uh, realization about, about a, a, on a spiritual topic. 
and and I thought of somebody that I could call and um and share it with, but then a resentment came up and said, and I thought to myself, no, I'm no, and and I lost the idea. The idea evaporated, and I can't get it back. I've been struggling trying to get it back because I knew it was significant. It was a good. It was something really good, something that I could use. But it's gone because because I corrupted it with uh, with small amount of resentment. So it's like, how much does that shut us down? You know, it just it shuts the brain down. Resentment actually shuts us down. And, and I see no value in that. So I don't know if any of you have experienced something like that, but um, I don't, I'm really focused on it. So, so I'm pretty uh, keenly aware of the cause and effect relationship of some of these things. You know, uh, yeah. We, we, go ahead. I, I've I've shared. So, I, someone else want to talk? Um, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, kind of a, along the lines of that, that two week prayer. And I've had, I had an experience at work where I, one of my bosses left and I had my eyes on this desk with this monitor at work and I didn't tell anybody. And then some new guy comes in and he, he's sitting there one day and I, I don't like him, you know? And so I thought about it and I'm like, well, this expectation I had was like self-centered expectation that nobody else knew about. He didn't know. He doesn't deserve to, for me to be upset at him. So I talked about it with someone and I basically ended up going out of my way to like do something nice for him, which just looked like me asking him some questions about himself and stuff like that is like the last thing I wanted to do. And it just kind of melted away. And I'm like, oh, okay, he's a decent guy. And this is good. So that's kind of a practical thing that happened. But um, on, a, on a deeper level, all these resentments I carry around my whole life from childhood and all this stuff, kind of looking at like some family members that are always critical and judging and negative. And, and I'm like learning that is that their fault or, or were they just brought up this way and their parents were this way and their parents were this way and, and just kind of gaining some understanding around the situation helped a lot. Um, as far as like, not what I perceive is happening. It's not, it's nothing personal, you know, it just is what it is and having some understanding of where they came from. Very, very, very helpful. Um, and just looking at it from another perspective, it's not about me. It's just the situation and what it is. So that kind of stuff has been helpful too. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's great. Just that you connected with the guy. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, uh, love is connection. That's for me. That's, that's my working definition for love is connection. So when when we break off connection, then we're we're hampering our ability to love. So so this is so we're talking about um, understanding people and their motives and uh, alchemically changing our attitude about them uh, just by opening up our horizon a little bit to see, you know, the humanity in the other person and and. Uh, understanding their motives or in just even as possibilities. But what about um, what about people who aren't so good? You know, what about people who really have a, a degree of maliciousness to them that they really they really mean you harm that and they do, they're doing it consciously and for whatever reason. You know, it's it's like we can't we can't really uh, and Bill, I thought you'd have something to say about this. Well, yeah, I wanted to get into that aspect, the resentment that, uh, again, I've, I've gotten better, obviously, at the resenting somebody who may be better off than you. you got to put that, you know, so be it. But I'm looking at that as the toxic people in your life. You sought to resent them. like, And 
from what I've learned strategy wise is sometimes you got to get those people out of your life because they're just toxic. And like you were just saying, these people who are not good, even your own family members may do things. And at one point, when do you say, uh, I, I just got to distance myself because it's almost like you, you're going to, you're just whipping a dead horse at one point for some reason, the connection or the resolution never happens. And it's like, Oh boy, you know, you just say, all right, I have to pull back somewhat, sometimes fully, partially, I don't know, you know, um, and again, that's my, a strategy when it comes to that kind of style, that when you're toxic to my life and you have to, and again, it, like some of these guys were saying, it, it could reflect something about yourself. Yeah, sure. You know, but it, until you figure that out and or uh, understand it, maybe distancing yourself from those toxic people is step one. That's all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. 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 That's all. Great. Great. Step one. Yeah, and and then too, it, with that distance, then it makes it even easier to pray for them because you have to you have to purge yourself of of those negative that toxicity. You know, if if their toxicity has gotten into you, you definitely want to get rid of that. So you have to again alchemically approach it, which is a fancy way of saying just pray for them. You know, replace those negative feelings with uh, positive. And like you know, again. Um... I don't know. Again, sometimes you can't get the people. Sometimes you say to yourself, it's not my job, maybe, at this point. Maybe it's just you you separate and let and let God go. Like let God handle it. Oh, so say, you know, at one point you say, I, I can't. Maybe down the road I could, but right now, that's all. And you have to kind of let go. And for whatever reasons, and these toxic people, you know, we can we can go on for weeks about that, but at sure. some point you say, you know what? I I I just right now can't, that energy toward it is just not worth it, maybe. Now, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's all. You know, there there are little rituals we can do, too. Uh, and this might sound magical or or uh, uh, or anything, but but it's like if you if you write something out, if you write, say, your resentment or your feelings, your negative feelings towards somebody, and then you crumple it up, crumple up the paper and take it outside and light a match to it. I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something deeply fundamental about that, you know, the imagery and the action of it uh, that goes way deeper than the mind and, and really does release, help us release those negative feelings. It burns, burns them out of us. You know, um, Michael, that, People might think that's, you know, oh, that sounds kind of woo-woo and right. new age and all that. But um, before Mooney left the Charleston area, when we lived in Charleston, um, I was, you know, doing a little bit of work with him. And, and he did, with a group of us, formed one of those rituals. And I had a resentment against um, my second or third cousin. Um, that I thought I would never, ever be rid of. And so I, I, I wrote it out, you know, and did exactly what, what you're talking about. And then we went out on the porch and um, burned it. And of course, you know, he has his little bells and stuff that he used, but I mean, it was, it was taken away. And when I think about it, it's not even, it's not even like a scar, you know, mm -hmm. there's not mm -hmm. even enough of it left to where there's a scar. Um, it's, it, it was amazing. Um, so I've experienced that working. Yeah. And, and for the rest of you, uh, uh, the person she's referring to is Muni Natarajan. He's a Hindu priest and a uh, good friend of Tom and Renee's and mine. Uh, so he's he spent he spent uh, over forty years in an, in an ashram in the Hindu monastery in Hawaii. So, so you know, and and some of these ancient practices are really have their. Uh, we're finding out more and more in cognitive science uh, the effects of sound 
on the brain and brain function. So, you know, there are the different brain states and, and sounds have their, their effect on these things. So, so science is, is uh, catching up with some of these technologies that are literally thousands of years old. And, and most people tend to regard these ancient peoples and their teachings as primitive, you know, compared to our scientific knowledge today, but uh, it's almost the opposite. It's almost like we're the primitives because of the scientific materialism that we're steeped in. And we've lost the consciousness of, of everything except the material world. Which is not a good position to be in because most of what causes things to happen in the physical world come from unseen places, you know, even, even things as simple as electromagnetism. We don't see it. It might as well be in a different dimension. You know, all we see is its effects. We don't see the thing itself. I don't know if we're even capable of seeing the thing itself. See. So anyway, I just, I thought I'd, I'd throw that in. So um, one of the things that gives us the most agency, the most power spiritually is, a, is objectivity. It's that, it's that center point, it's that middle path where you're neither intensely for something or intensely against it. And it's the loss of objectivity that really, really is the, can throw us into suffering. And, and I see it, I see in the analogy in it in the Garden of Eden, because what got them kicked out, it was, it was viewing the world through the lens of good and evil. This is good, that's evil. Whereas before things are just, they just are. And, and I think that that's the most powerful position we can be in is when things just are. And my, my, favorite, my favorite movie quote in regards to this is out of uh, Godfather 2, I think it was, um, where Michael Corleone takes his young protege aside and says, never hate your enemies. It affects your judgment. <laughs> Profound truth in that. And, and the thing I like about it is, is that, you know, it, in so many cases, you're not dealing with, with a good person. If you're confronted with somebody who really means you harm, then... Uh, how do you love him or her? How do you love your enemy? Because the, the, the misconception is that loving your enemy, enemy will somehow magically turn him into a friend. And that's not really true. I mean, it's true sometimes, but not all the time. So how do you love your enemy as your enemy? See, and, and I think... The key to that is objectivity. It's it's the removal of uh, if you're if you're heavily biased in one direction, that sets you up to be reactive. And if you're reactive, you're already at a disadvantage because you know your enemy then has you on your back foot. The way the saying goes, then then he's controlling the engagement. But if you're objective and you're not reacting, then you can at the very least stay centered and balanced. But And that's the perfect place from which to initiate an action. So um, you, you get what I mean? You're following this? This is, I think it's a different take on, on love your enemy. I know it's a different take because I've not heard anybody else talk about it like this. So, so I think what, what comes out of that is uh, are things like chivalry, uh, rules of engagement, uh, the civilized prosecution of war. Um, it's like everything that makes us... Uh, uh, more decent and less barbaric in conflict, 
I think stems from this objectivity that's made possible by um, by loving your enemy. There's a, one of the readings that said, talks about how instead of basically trying to be helpful to people that we resent like that, that's our new focus. Right. Yeah. And it says something about we trying to love them, but maybe we can't love everyone. So at least we try to tolerate them. Um, what do you think about that? Um, I'm not really good at that. <laughs> um to tolerate uh yeah yeah of course you know there there are differences that uh because not everybody is is compatible right and and that's that's part of wisdom itself is knowing that that compatibility or incompatibility can be an issue and then like bill said just get some distance from that person don't don't try to push the river or don't try to swim up upstream you know but and and then um, you know, I like I like too. My working definition for for forgiveness is to give the person space to be who they are, mm -hmm. to not bring expectations or demands to the situation. You know, just let them be who they are. If that's who they are, you're not going to change that. And if and if you're incompatible with that, then you know, get away. Yeah, Bill. Uh, just to briefly again, you know, um, as I was saying, you know, about people who are trying to hurt you. And I'll use my example from my experience in life is I was a cop. I've had some people try to kill me straight up. You know, you get them under arrest eventually. And I've learned not to take it so personal because when you start, to, if you have that lens to view it like, you know, Everyone's in a different time zone in their development, spiritually or some sort. They're lost people. I had a guy put a gun to my head one night and it was going to kill me, you know, and I still didn't hate him. You know, I'm trying to say I would tell people, listen, I came across a lot of people. Very rarely was somebody the evil incarnate. They were just lost souls, so to say. You get it? So I, maybe I'm fortunate that I didn't go down that rabbit hole and just want to hate these people. I don't know. But uh realizing that again everyone's a different time zone and like i said sometimes it's not your role to like you said move the river sometimes it's like let's just you know back off that's all i'm saying yeah yeah that's good i like that i like that yeah i would like to add something if i can sure wes um hi everyone my name's wes sorry i was a little late um, and I'm sitting in my car, two kids and wife in the house, I had to find a little solitude here. Um, but my wife and I were actually just talking about something similar um, to where we're at in this conversation this morning. And um, one of the important things we were talking about was number one, separating the person and the action. Like we can, we can, we can possibly even, you know, move into the realm of like hating an action. Right. But separating it from the person how do we still show empathy love and compassion to the person and what we um, where our conversation led us today is like there's so many layers so many octaves to who an individual actually is and the part that we see as Wes or as Michael or as any one of you that are on this phone call today is just the very tip of an iceberg right and there's so much below the surface more fully embodies and represents who that individual that may be causing you pain actually is. And if you can <clears throat> learn to see yourself fully, then you understand what's below the surface because what's below the surface is the same for us all, right? It's just this little tiny portion of the iceberg sticking above that once the action reaches that point, once the you know, once the expression has reached the point of physicality, um, you know, why did it show itself through this individual? This individual was the weakest link as far as you know, what we're compressing inside of all of us individually and or collectively. It has to have somewhere to come out to show us what 
what we're hiding from, what we're afraid of, what we're searching for, or, you know, whatever the case may be, it has to have an avenue to express itself into the physical domain. And so whomever the individual is, we could be talking about Jeffrey Dahmer here, right? That individual, like the amount of empathy I have for someone that was in such a place that this atrocity was allowed to bubble up through him and express itself into the physical domain. Now, what he did was horrible, but that person, all he ever wanted was love, right? And we had a conversation yesterday um, where you brought up what happened when you freely opened your heart and gave love to a situation that seemed chaotic. And that's the same course of action that we need to try to take with individuals, whether they're, you know, bringing us pain or joy or whatever the case may be. It's understanding what's below that surface and connecting to that part, which is so much more expansive. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Than the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's another factor here, Wes, too, that we have to take into consideration. And sometimes they're just weak links. You know, people with a weak mind and a weak sense mm -hmm. of self can then become an outlet for the collective consciousness or the collective unconscious, collective shadow to burst through. Correct. Yes. You know, and, and that's so. And then you're dealing with something almost not human. You know, you're dealing more like with a it robot. Has a life or, of its own. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I and I think that I think that's that might be at the root of the popularity of zombie movies. You know, because because we're drawn, we're fascinated by things that we recognize within ourselves. And you know, a lot of the commentators on zombie movies say that uh, the zombies are us. That's what people are responding to. Right. Right. And and so so we have to we have to recognize that uh, sometimes what we're dealing with is not a person. But a thing, it's a shadow, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a collective uh, thought form that is almost uh, like an NPR or a NR. Not what is it in a video game? A non-participating character in a video game, NPC. Oh, I don't know that world. <laughs> <laughs> I have a twenty-year-old. So. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Lucky <Yeah>. you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's. There's a missing ingredient here, and I think that it w really needs to be addressed, and that is the issue of boundaries. You know, because we're all nice people here, right? I think. Let me look. Yeah, yeah, we're all nice people here, and and so we're we're open. You know, we're open for, to new ideas. We're we're uh, we're forgiving. We want people to get along. We we just want the world to be a good place, right? The problem with, with us, people like that, people like this, is that uh, we tend to be too open and too forgiving and, uh, and lacking of any kind of, uh, uh, we don't expect people to meet a, kind, a, a minimum standard. Yet in reality, we do because everybody does. I mean, that's part of our human makeup is to, is to have boundaries because boundaries a boundary is a is an archetypal form and so if if our boundaries are too porous then we become like a uh we become susceptible to viruses just like a cell if if its boundary is not intact uh or or an organ or any kind of tissue if its boundary is is compromised then it's it's subject to infection and then uh and then the virus moves in and takes over and and you're gone. So what about this? What about this issue of boundaries? What you know, because we're 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 talking about projection, we're talking about loving our enemy, uh, we're talking about healing the world, all these kinds of things. Uh how do how do you see boundaries playing into this? Michael, I'll I um, appreciate this. And I just coming um with uh, what Wes said and uh Bill or William. And you it's coming full circle for me. Um, to, in order to set a healthy boundary, I've got to be clear of emotional reactivity and resentment. And I think you've said that because if 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 I'm not, I'm not seeing the situation clearly. Um, you know, in, in a with a Christian, deep Christian upbringing, uh, love your neighbor as yourself concept. And so if 
you know, um, and I would naively try to apply that to, you know, first of all, having an understanding, a childlike understanding that love is a feeling. And that, that if somebody were had done something wrong to me, um, one, if I would become overly angry, um, um, I didn't like that. I didn't think spiritual people got angry. Now, I've come to learn that there's uh, it, it, uh, volatile rage is not appropriate. That's a not appropriate, not appropriate response. It's not really going to get you anywhere except maybe in handcuffs. Um but that 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 if what I'm trying to say is that to set a healthy boundary with a person like that who's dangerous, first thing is I've got to be not reactive, um, and I, I've got to not try to apply this childhood viewpoint of having a positive feeling about this other person. So I think that's where the you know as we integrate what we're talking about is we're integrating talking about integrating shadow. We're talking about a process. Um, I can get clear enough to, and have enough emotional balance to see the situation for what it really is or isn't. Um, so that's what this is bringing up for me in regards to your last question. Yeah, great. Can I, can I share a story? Um, and, and Tom, this, uh, this involves somebody that you and I both know really well. He lives, uh, he lives close to you, a couple hours away. <laughs> and he and I were sitting on the beach in San Francisco, right below the cliff house, and uh, which is about, uh, like there's a cliff maybe 40 feet tall, 30, 40 feet tall. And we're sitting on the sand, looking at the ocean, having a, having a conversation, kind of like this one, and or, you know, spiritual conversation. And... Uh, all of a sudden, I hear this plop, and I, you know what's that? And then another plop, and I see it's a rock, you know, about the size of a tennis ball, uh, landing really close to us. And uh, and I look up, and from the uh, from the observation deck uh, next to the cliff house, there are a couple of teenagers, and they're throwing rocks at us, and. So I stood up and I looked at him right in the eye and I said, you knock that shit off right now. <laughs> you know, just, just really just gathered every bit of fire and teeth that I could. And they were like, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and they stopped, you know, and, and they, they bugged out. And, uh, and then I sat back down and without, with no, you know how sometimes you get angry, you get flushed, and uh, you have kind of an internal reaction? There was none of that, not a speck of it. And and I just continued in the conversation as though nothing had happened, because because it didn't affect me, right? I hadn't, it had no internal effect on me. And he looked at me like <laughs> that same that same thing he just said, you know, the spiritual people should never get angry, you know, and he was he was scandalized, you know. <laughs> so so um but that's boundary, right? That's that's having a boundary. And when something impacts your boundary, it should feel something. It should feel a reaction, but it doesn't have to be a an emotional reaction, nor does it have to be uh, out of proportion, you know, this kind of thing. But uh, I've been around people, I think psychologically, the term for uh, the psychological trait is disagreeable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, people, people like that, they, um, they don't care what you think. You know, they just they they don't care, and uh, and but they're very action oriented and and are very uh, uh, they get things done, and um, so and I've got uh, I have very little of that, so I have to cultivate it, and uh, you know so that I can use it when I need it, and um, so so that's a way you can tell if 
in in working with your boundaries if it if if it affects you in a negative way if getting angry affects you you feel bad about getting angry then your anger wasn't clean mm -hmm. you know it wasn't true true fire it was uh mixed with water you know and earth it's muddy i appreciate that story a lot that kind of really clarifies um it's it sounds like the right way to to respond to something so i that gives me something to uh, strive for. So I appreciate that. You bet. You bet. You know, this, this gets at ownership that where we have to, we have to own the ground we stand on. And if we don't, if we think that it belongs to somebody else, then we're easily pushed off of it. And if we're, if we're not allowed, or if we don't allow ourselves to own the ground ground we stand on, we can't grow. Because it's only by owning owning yourself that you can act authentically, or or uh, you know in touch with reality. The, the the metaphor is really accurate because because if you know where you stand, then then you're solid, right? You're dependable. People know what to expect. And so you become like a, a point of stability in, in an unstable world. And you're going to naturally then draw people to you who, who value that. So, so it's, it's ultimately healthy. It's one of the most healthy things you can do is to take ownership of, of that which is bounded you know, with the, the space you occupy, both mentally, emotionally, spiritually, the space you occupy has to be yours. You have to take ownership of it. Does that make sense? It does, Michael. And I wonder, I think I know that what you'll say is, this is something I've struggled with um, uh, as well as to be that disagreeable. And I have to cultivate disagreeableness. Um, and Andrew helped a lot with that because he had a personality. He was an Aries for one thing. And if, if something didn't sound or seem right to him, he was just going to speak up. Well, that that's not me. But I wonder mm -hmm. if you wouldn't, you wouldn't agree, or we, I think you would agree that our presence in the world, an authentic presence in the world calls for that type of action from us. And by extension, that's a way that we, in a way that we can serve. Yeah. Truth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you have to have it in order to be of service. So I've I've met uh, you know on the other side I've seen I've seen teachers who uh, but by the other side I mean in in the transcendent state in which I'm aware of the next plane. Um, you know, like it, sometimes you experience in dreams, you know, and, and that's a lot of times the way it happens where you have a dream that's not really a dream and you kind of, you suspect that it's not just a dream, you know, not the product of your brain, but, uh, but, a, but a real experience on a transcendent level. And the, the people I've run into there who, uh, are there to help and to teach, they're very impersonal just extremely mm -hmm. impersonal they can be they can be affectionate they can be kind and understanding but it's like enough it's a, a a detached affection and which you know speaks to boundaries right because can you be affectionate can you open up to somebody without opening up right in other words can you give can you give to them of yourself without getting the backflow. You know, there's mm -hmm. this there's this mechanical device in in uh, uh in plumbing and and uh steam fitting that's called a check valve. And if you put it in you put it in line in a pipe and it's it lets water flow one direction but not in the other direction. So it's it's uh it's like that. 
it's like a diode, I think, in electrical in an electrical circuit. It only allows current to flow in one direction. And so we have to have some equivalent of a check valve in our atmosphere, in our boundaries, where our giving doesn't open up to receive something that's not helpful or healthy for us. See, so we have to have a flow going without depleting us. And in order to, to do that, in order to be able to give without diminishing yourself, you have to be open. You have to have an open valve to that which is above you, you know, from, from the higher up. You have to be open to God, but positive to people. Negative to God, positive to people. You see, and, and this is this is a an acquired skill. It's not something that just comes naturally. The idea of positive and negative can get slippery. Just like what meaning does that have? What 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 comes to mind in the individual that you speak those words to can yeah. be such like I, I, I struggle with that. I struggle with using the words masculine and feminine as well, especially with those of, you know, whatever generation this is, like my son's age, they're all trying to navigate the, uh, you know, the ideas of what's supposed to be masculine and what's supposed to be feminine. And, and I get that, but like, like those are two words to me that I like to use, but I understand the difficulty in transferring the information appropriately, positive and negative is another one. Um, you know, you tie the negative side of the pole of the magnet to the femininity and the positive side of the pole of the magnet to masculinity and you look at it that way, we need to be like the wife of God, right? Right, right. Um, so well, um, dancing well, we, we, around those concepts is always difficult for me. <laughs> I, I think the best way to, to navigate that is uh, thinking of, in terms of power, force, and energy. So when we talk about mm -hmm. positive and negative, we're really talking about flow. It's either outflow right, or backflow, right. right? Inflow, yeah. Yeah, and and we're talking about too uh, the fundamental uh, principle of uh, polarity, you know. And and this is mm -hmm. a fundamental part of the spiritual teachings. We see it in uh, all all of the symbols for the major religions have the same. They're all the same in terms of power, force, and energy. The yin yang symbol. Mm -hmm is positive and negative. The crescent and moon, solar energy, lunar energy, radiant, reflective. Uh, you have, you have uh, uh, Judaism, the, the two triangles, one's up, one's down, one's heaven, one's earth, you see? And the cross, there, you know, another perfect symbol. You've got, you've got positive and negative. Active, but there's passive, a... expansive, contractive, electric, magnetic. You see, those are the those are the basic polarities that we're dealing with. And once we we become aware of them and learn how to use them, then then questions of gender and uh, boundaries and all of that they start to make sense. Mm -hmm. But you can't You're take, you know, you, you, you can't mess with polarity. You know, you can't, you can't disrespect it because anything you do in terms of polarity, you're going to change the whole system. Or, and if you do work with it, which is what we do in electricity, right? Our computers are the manipulation of, of uh, electrical potential. Ones and zeros, so mm -hmm. positive, negative. You see, but we start messing with that then um, we're trying to mash them together and we lose the, the creative potential in it. it. We flatline it, in other words. I think that's the real flat right. earth phenomenon. You know, it's, it's where, you, you know, flat earthers are like, they're, they're trying to articulate, I think, this principle, where if you try to reduce everything if you try to strip the polarity out of stuff, what you're left with is flatline. And that's death, right? The greater, the greater the polarity, the more potential for action. Right. 
You see, and that's when life is interesting, it's constructive, it's it's destructive in the way that it can clear the path, you know, for something to then be built. So I think if we look at it in terms of power, force, and energy, then it starts to make a lot better sense. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Wes? Is that? Yeah, no, I agree completely. In fact, a big part of when I was during my journey across America, when I was going through the innovate the uh, uh, Henry Ford Museum of Innovation, right? Like what what was really speaking to me was the idea of power and man's mani manipulation of it and how we have evolved from, you know, it really just being the power we could exert to create something to, you know, steam power and all these other types of things. But it was always about man's manipulation and control of power. Um, and so, you know, having time during the reflecting process of driving part of the trip and like really thinking about that, um, number one finding that source of power from within instead of trying to manipulate something from without for this outside and speaking to the boundaries that we're speaking of something that's been in my head a lot is the idea of the firmament and that you know which has been locked away inside versus that which is outside of it and like ultimately that creates a trinity right and there's this in between in between what's inside and what's outside there's this boundary called the firmament and and I feel like that it's it's in that line where we are bubbling out of that which is in the power which is in the that which we truly are into this these forms right it's like that firmament is the reality that we see and and interact with um, but it flows both ways so like on that sh straight straight line you have the things that are bubbling out from within that are inserting themselves into that which is outside and then you have the things bubbling inward right and it creates a frequency and i think th these frequencies are what we deal with when we're you know trying to increase or decrease or whether the atom becomes hydrogen or helium or carbon or whatever the case may be it's within this boundary this firmament that all of that's occurring and um, the disconnect between, especially shows up in relationships with men and women, but it's that one is from the inside expressing themselves outward and the other one's in the outside expressing themselves inward. And while we're using the same words, terms, and terminology, our language is completely different, right? right. And so right. What, what I explain through the firmament to the inner it becomes extraordinarily difficult to paint the picture of what I'm truly trying to say to the person that speaks the language of the inner trying to express themselves outward. And, yeah. Um, well, it isn't, isn't the problem then just a failure to understand uh, or yes. the, in the act, action of uh, assuming that the other person is just like you, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's an undeveloped frame of mind. Right. right. And, and it's a lack of objectivity where everything is subjective, where, you know, I right. feel this way. So everybody else must feel the same way, too. Mm -hmm. So so I think that in, in what you're talking about, you know, that interaction from above and below that we're really talking about an interface. Inner and outer. Yeah, it's really not above and below. It's that's a perspective that uh, the one thing I did want to add, like the flat earth. I think most of us live in a two dimensional reality which is where there is no depth to it, right? It's just this single layer, which still has depth because it's a layer, but to 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 live in, in something more, we have to expand up and down. We have to align with that source of who we really are, like you were talking about. Instead of trying to suck the energy from outside of us, we have to be the source of energy. We have to emulate the process that is that source of energy. And we do that right, by right. expanding yeah. north and south, right? And so um, the idea or concept of awakening to me is to going from a two-dimensional plane to a three-dimensional plane where you begin to see and live, um, you know, and yeah. actually walk through versus flowing through um, this firmament we call reality. And... And yeah, that, it, it can begin 
I think in your example of male and female, I mean, that's really the uh, the testing ground. That's that's where we yeah completely. You that's know, where we yeah. interface, like you said. Yeah, and it's and it's under it, and then it all boils down to understanding. You know, do I understand you? You know, mm -hmm. can I really get out of the way enough to really hear you and see what and see what you're saying, and take that at face value? You know, to like and appreciate uh, it. Yeah, and appreciate it. But uh, and then once you understand it, and like in communication, right? The best thing is to repeat back to the person what what you think you heard them say, and you do that until they say, "Yeah, that yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying." And then you've right, got something right. to work with. There, there. That's the interface. You see, because because that's what we're dealing with. We're always dealing with an with an, whenever we have a, a polarity situation going on, which is always. Uh, it's the interface where where things get transferred back and forth. Mm -hmm. right? And we are that interface. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are the full yeah. embodiment of that interface. Yeah. Well, to we're the point you know we have creative capacity. Yeah, yeah. We're and we're interfacing with the world, so we have to have something. There's always uh, there's always this and that and the thing, the medium in between. Right. You know, there's you, there's me, and there's the the idea, the realm of ideas that we're that we're discussing, and we're we're looking for ways to fit those together. Mm -hmm. You see, but but that so the function of the 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 health of the interface becomes everything. Correct. It's like, how do I interface with the world? Am I am I allowing myself to see what's there, or am I projecting on it? Or am I defending against? Or am I imposing upon? It all becomes a matter of how we interact with the world. That's right. And how closely we can align ourselves to the process that is the world expressing itself. God. How closely can we align ourselves to God is how much joy, happiness, you know, love, all those things right. that we supply to the world yeah. versus take from the world. Yeah. I, I, so, to me, to me the know, world the is, it, is... I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. Um, no, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Okay. To, to me, the world is fairly neutral. You know, it has its agenda in, you know, like in nature... Nature uh, is uh, is always busy reproducing itself and to mm -hmm. establishing a, a you know it wants to grow it wants to replenish and it's competing with other parts of itself to do that but it's all done in, in a neutral in a neutral way it doesn't really have an agenda um, there's a evolutionary biologist named Brett Weinstein who talked about this I thought it was brilliant. He said that yeah, evolution doesn't really have a uh, doesn't have an end goal. All it wants to do is uh, how do you say it? he wants it wants a particular genetic spelling to survive. That's all it is. Right. And so when when one genetic uh, when one species it, species in other words they just want to survive and they will do so. Uh, it, without regard to another species you see and then there's this checks and balances thing that, that happens and all of that's neutral and we have to realize there's part of that that goes on in in our lives that we're dealing with automatic mechanical forces which are basically natural forces mm -hmm. and that if we recognize them as such then we don't take them personally and then we're we're right. more able to create boundaries and and boundaries can be definitional boundaries too like we don't try to make one word mean something else. We don't try to invert reality just through manipulating the words. You see, so so boundary the sen our sense of boundaries is multidimensional. We have emotional boundaries, we have mental boundaries, we have spiritual boundaries, and we have physical boundaries, and all of those have to be in alignment. When they when they get out of alignment, say uh, if your emotional boundaries get out of alignment uh, and your 
and you just feel like you have to accommodate the emotions of everyone around you at the expense of your own, that's going to reflect in your physical boundaries and you're going to, and those boundaries will be violated. Mm -hmm. See, but if you know yourself and you know what is, uh, uh, what's acceptable and what's not. And that's an interface problem, right? If something is right. unacceptable, that means your interface is programmed in such a way that you will not let that get through it. And right. But if you don't have a sense of that, or if you lack the courage to really set that boundary, or, or maybe you think that you shouldn't, you see, maybe you've been conditioned to think that you shouldn't have that kind of boundary, that you should be open to whatever anybody has to say or what they believe or how they feel, that kind of thing, that's going to reflect in all of your other areas too. You you will get sick because right. your 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 boundaries are part of your physiology and one affects the other. See. For so sure. It's real, They're all connected. Yeah, yeah. So it's real important to know where you stand. And, and even if, even if where you stand is not entirely correct, you'll find out, you see, that's the learning curve, but that has to happen within you. You can get feedback from other people saying, Hey, where you, where you're standing, it's in a pile of crap. You know, you really, right. you really should move. <laughs> and, and you can say, you look down, you look where you're standing and say, it doesn't look like crap to me. <laughs> right but you take note you know so and so right. <laughs> thinks that i'm not in a good place so but then it's up to you to determine that you can't right but if you're if you're wide open you're going to be pushed around the 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 chessboard of life endlessly until you're knocked off the board altogether <laughs> right yeah that makes sense yeah I know this is all really abstract, but it's but I think it's real enough to where it makes sense, right? Well, owning to knowing where you stand and owning the land you stand on. I mean, if you think about trying to move anywhere from one point to another, if you don't know where you are, how can you how how can you put together any type of movement pattern other than random and chaotic to get from where you are to where you want to be like yeah. even if you can see where you want to be and can visualize that if you don't know where you are there's no real way to move towards that yeah right like yeah. you want to go to disney world you know it's in florida but if you don't know where in the world you are you can't plan a trip there right yeah so that, that reminds um, me of a documentary only, i saw where this person, these this couple got abducted by aliens. It was a documentary on on alien right. abduction, and in they found out through hypnosis they they had, their minds had been wiped and they couldn't they couldn't remember anything about it. But they went in for marriage counseling and they used hypnosis as a part of that. And both of them independently started coming up with this matching story of being abducted by aliens. Fascinating stuff. Wow. Yeah, that's but, cool. But the the woman, I think. Uh, she uh, she recounted, she said she was inside the spaceship and there was a map, a star map. And uh, she asked the alien tel telepathically because that's how they communicated. Uh, she asked him or her, where are you from? And the alien asked her, well, where are you? And she looked at the map and said, I don't know. And he said, well, what does it matter then where we're from? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <Good> point. <laughs> so you really do have to know yourself, you know, in order to right. navigate successfully in the world. And that's what shadow work is all about. It's knowing it's, you know, it's like rolling up the carpet to expo expose the floor underneath what's under there, you know, <laughs> How much, how much mm -hmm. dust and lint and right, whatever else right. is under there, you know? You have to kind of strip everything to the studs. That's right. Right. Yeah. How far do you want to take it down? Yeah. <laughs> how far do you want to tear it down to start rebuilding? Yeah. I, I tell you, I'd rather do that myself than to have other people do it. For sure. Right. I'd rather do my, my own self-discovery because I can, then I can control it.
You know, I can control the rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um have people at the door waving at me. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So I have thoroughly enjoyed. I will um I will definitely start joining you all for as many of these as I can. This is fun. Oh great, Wes. So, be really great uh, to have you. Thank you. Nice meeting whoever is still on the line. All righty. Yes. Take care. And, um thank you all for whoever else is still on the line. Yep. Bye. Bye bye. Who else? Anybody have anything they'd like to add? Or subtract? <laughs> yeah, I think when I started this kind of work, um, <clears throat> it's like, yeah, the, the work has to be done by myself, right? For And I have to be willing to look at these things and strip away, you know, the top layer to, to dig deep. But um, it was super helpful to have someone that could that was wise and objective to, to kind of guide me on that path. Cause just from my own perspective, uh, my, it wasn't healthy. You know, I, I couldn't give a solid self-assessment and still right. to this day, sometimes it's better, but sometimes it has, it helps to have another perspective to give truth to the situation. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, ultimately then the decision is yours as to what to do with the, the assessment, right? You have to you have to yeah. decide from within yourself. You have to find you have to find the, the place within you. God, I just read a quote, uh, something like, um, "You can't write until you discover the need to say something. You can't really write about something unless you have a need to say it. Without the need, there's no there's no juice behind it. There's no there's no there's no polarity." Because need is polarity. The greater the need, the farther the two poles are apart. And then you, and then they reach the point where they're wide enough apart to where something has to give, and then you have the act of creation. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah, want to get creative, need, there's... yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. I, my my working definition for prayer is is the art of creating a vacuum. If you're praying for something and you're not getting it, you you're not working with the polarity right. You haven't created a big enough need for it. That'll cook your noodle. Is, is action. <laughs> Is uh is that need creating action towards that a part of it? Oh yeah, you know it's a build it and they will come kind of thing. If you're praying for something, you have to you have to create the need for it. In in esoteric prayer, you know, in the in the in the art of prayer, um, part of it is to um. Uh, it, it's to create the polarity, to create the need, but you have to, you have to know what you're willing to accept. Now, this is a, the biggest reason why people don't get their prayer answered is because they're praying for something they're really not willing to accept. Mentally, they think they want it, but in their heart, they don't. It's like, um, it's like uh, winning the lottery. Just you, did you know that most people who win the lottery go broke? And it, it yeah, it's a, it's a well documented phenomenon where it it upends people's lives so drastically that they they scramble to get back to where they were, and they they um, they just cannot tolerate the difference. So um, and and just think about it, you know. Say if all of a sudden you you were uh, unimaginably wealthy, you know. <clears throat> And how would that affect your, your relationships, your friends, your family? You know, how would they see you? That it would change everything. It would change, it would change your whole life and not in very good ways. So, so I think a lot of the times people buy a ticket to the lottery to win the lottery, but inside their prayer is don't let me win this. 
it's like be careful what you pray for you might you might get it the grass and, is not always greener right <laughs> no yeah yeah they they've they've actually done studies where they find that uh, after a certain uh level of income uh your quality of life does not get better or worse as long as you can pay your bills and you have a reasonable freedom in your life, you're good. And then a lot of money can then become an, an, an enormous burden. That's my excuse. How about you? <laughs> the, the truth of why people hang around you and, and stuff comes out at that point, which do you really want to learn that? Yeah. And nothing is less attractive than a needy person. Right. I think that's what high school is all about. <laughs> God, I hated high school. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and that's part of, you know, once, see, the shadow, these shadow elements that we're dealing with, they create a polarity. But the problem is they're an unconscious polarity. And, and the farther we get separated from ourselves in that way, then the greater reactivity there is. And everything that comes along that can trigger that polarity, uh, then it manifests in unexpected, surprising, embarrassing ways. So if we get in and we, and we really acknowledge and own those, it's not like we collapse the polarity, but we get a flow going through, a productive flow so that there's energy energy is is power in motion right so we get we're we're dealing with the power of the polarity but we're creating a flow which then manifests as vitality and creativity in our lives and boundary health you see because because we have a system that's in that's healthy and and the energy is flowing but when energy gets blocked and doesn't flow that's when problems arise. I have an energy healer friend who says, that's what pain is. Pain is blocked energy. So to relieve pain, you have to unblock the energy. That's what acupuncture is about. So the shadow work is so essential to, that's definitely pain management, but you're getting ahead of the pain. You know, you're you're preventing you're preventing this unhealthy buildup of polarity, polar opposites. The tension gets too great, and then it's going to snap and and explode in different ways, blow your life out. So the shadow work is absolutely essential, and and I think I think right now astrologically they're saying that's what. That's what the whole place is going through. Something to do with Pluto and Neptune and Aquarius. And um, I'm not not well versed astrologer, so I, I know just enough to get in trouble with it. But right now, that's what's happening in, in this great time of revolution. I think the last time this kind of astrological configuration was in existence was the Revolutionary War. So that's the good news. <laughs> so, uh, you know, everybody keeps saying, hang under your hats, you know, buckle your seatbelts because 2024 is uh, going to be a hell of a ride. So, time now to get, get, your in, get your own house in order, right? That date keeps coming up amongst my, uh, like the tr my people that I know that predict uh, future, like for trading and stuff like that, and have effectively done so and proven it. And that, that date keeps coming up for them too. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Everybody has a sense of foreboding about it, but you know, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. I like to to think. Uh, I like to think of it as. Uh, Okay, what would it be like if I have no electricity, no running water, um, no gasoline, <laughs> no internet, 
all of the, what would I do? <laughs> and that, you know, and I don't mean total collapse, but just intermittent disturbances or disruptions, you know? Uh, how upended are you, are you going to be? So that's exciting, huh? <laughs> they they say that what eighty percent of the world's population would die in such a case within like a couple months or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it'd be absolutely devastating. And it doesn't even have to be social unrest. It could be something like a major solar flare, like that happened in the Carrington event in the eighteen hundreds. The solar flare was so strong that uh, telegraph wires burned. Just burst into flames. That would that would set us back years. I mean, you know, we could go for undetermined amounts of times without of time without electricity. So, God, what a downer! It's a fun <laughs> one to think about, right? Hey, yeah, thanks, right. Mike. Way to, what a way to go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for my weekend your speech. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> Oof, where's the noose? Holy cow, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know bottle? that holy smokes. <laughs> I know, I know. The bottle, the noose, the gun, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's like a Chinese Ooh. curse, you know, may you live in, in interesting times, you know. <laughs> So whatever it is, we have front row seats, right? I kind of look at this as what's going on is what needs to happen. We're evolving as a, as a planet, call it what you want, that we're going through something. And it's our decision and how we handle this as, yeah. as a planet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if I mean, look, I don't even put the news on anymore because I find it disgusting and, and negative. It's almost yeah. like we're being psych. There's a psychological drama going on. You know, we have to choose. Yeah. You know, at some point, it, 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 and we need to. It's like it has to happen. You know, I'm trying to say, like, we're evolving and it, it has to happen. We can't avoid this. It's going right. to happen. Right. And it's our choice, our free will, how we want to call it, how we move forward. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's an example in our lessons on prayer of uh, the farmer who has a barn and uh, uh, lightning strikes the barn and burns it down. And so he rebuilds the barn, only this time he puts a lightning rod on top. And so the lightning is inevitable. That's going to happen sooner or later. Uh, but now when it hits the, the barn, it hits the lightning rod and the charge is immediately discharged to ground. And so he's not changed anything. He hasn't stopped the lightning, but he's stopped the lightning from burning down the barn. But then he realizes if he takes that, that ground wire and instead of just driving it into the earth, he takes it and drops it down as well. Then every time the lightning uh, strikes the lightning rod, it purifies the water in the well. So, so you're right. These things need to happen. The only question now is how are we going to manage it? What are we going to do with well, it? Are we going to use it or not? It's, it's unfortunate that such few can cause such uh, ill on this planet. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, they won't win eventually, but it's unfortunate they leave a disaster in their wake. Right. Sometimes. And, you know, when, listen, oh, I, oh. I don't know. You know yeah. Yeah. And Bill, uh, you know, I, I listen to a lot of really smart people uh, talking about these issues. And one of the most amazing things I've heard them say is that, you know, these people, this small group of people that are causing all the problems, they're not actually doing it maliciously. They're doing it stupidly. They don't realize what they're, that what they're trying to do will have catastrophic results. They just don't, they think they're going to fix the world. You see, so, and that puts a whole new spin on it. I mean, of well, course, we, we can't fix the world at the end of a rifle, though. You know, what I'm trying to say, you know, uh, exactly, you know, exactly. Yeah, you know, oh, you'll change at the at the point of my gun. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. You know, we don't blow people right. to change and blow them up. 
And we, I right. think we should realize that now. Enough with this. Like, yeah. It hasn't worked. It never will work. There's something else we have to do and decide and, and make a decision here, this planet. But all I see is people throwing gas in the fire, honestly. Right, right. Yeah, I think it requires yeah. 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 It requires dialogue. People have to be open and stand up. Absolutely. And yeah. Speak what they believe and what they know to be true. And if they... The worst thing that you can do is is agree with something that you really don't agree with or not say something out of fear. It, 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 there's, a, there's a high casualty rate in that, but but it's just simply, I mean, if we had been if we had been forthright with all of this for you know all along, this con these conditions would be far less in their severity. But we've been not lazy. We've just been busy. You know, we've been too busy to pay attention what goes on in the government or in the churches or any of the thought leading institutions that we have, you know, that we just trusted that they would take care of things, but they didn't, they didn't, they've, they've gone off the rails. Yep. And so, so now it is dangerous to speak up, but it's kind of our own fault. We have to, we made the bed, we have to lie in it and, and just speak up. That's but kind of back major. to what I was. Oh, it's, go ahead, buddy. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. Just that, just kind of what I said was that this kind of has to happen to mature us as a species, maybe. That we have, oh, yeah. we can't just, we have to mature. We can't just, you know, this is a, a process to the world is waking up. Hey, wait a minute. Hold up. You know, let's all get on the same sheet of music here and, get, you know, and not let this happen. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, I got into a, a thing on Facebook uh, just this morning where uh, somebody who was uh, is a uh, uh, a priest in the Christian community, uh, the the church kind of the rotates around Rudolf Steiner. Um, very, you know, very uh, enlightened uh, teaching, and but he's he's arguing for teaching. Um, kids to be ashamed uh, of of the slavery ashamed of being white essentially and um and teaching uh young black kids that they are victims and that this is oh the 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 meme was uh they showed a picture of of a of this little kid three three years old three or four years old in a ku klux klan uh outfit at a ku klux klan meeting and then they showed a little black child about the same age picking cotton as a slave. And uh, and the, the, the meme was, uh, if these kids are old enough to do these things, they're old enough to learn about them. And I thought, wow, you know, you're going to teach kids to either be ashamed or to be hate or to feel uh, like a victim? That's what we want to take young, impressionable minds and and mold them into. I mean, just exactly the opposite of uh, the Waldorf school system that Rudolf Steiner started. Totally opposite, you know. Totally uh, the exact opposite of of everything we we think of is good and a good way to raise children. You don't expose them to things they're not ready for. Right. And yet and yet there are very otherwise spiritual and enlightened people out there advocating for taking kindergartners and first graders and teaching them about this stuff. It's just not right. It's not right. And it's it only fuels division and teaches kids that they're either the problem or they're the victim of the problem. How is that going to work? You see? These are the kinds of things we have to speak out about, you know? My classes don't usually go this way, but we're all men here now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> and, and we don't usually talk about these things in my classes because um, because that's what Facebook is for. <laughs> that's one thing I've learned recently is kind of uh, 
is standing up for what's right and taking that action more and not being, you know, scared or uh, of confrontation or whatever is going to happen in order to do that. But also talking to an individual and they're not open to anything I'm going to say, maybe not waste, not spending my time doing that, just maybe spending my time elsewhere, trying to find a balance. Well, okay, guys. Bill, you're on mute. That's kind of the analogy of the uh, the donkey and the uh, the tiger, where the donkey says the grass is blue. Have you heard that whole story? Uh. Uh-uh. And you, but basically, the the lion said, "Why are you having an argument with the donkey insisting the grass is blue? You know it's green, but I'm punishing you because you keep trying to, you know." Go look it up, guys. It's it's very cool. It's all over the place, you know. It's an interesting thing. And and what's it called? Uh, the donkey and the tiger, or something like that. I think it's all over the place. The donkey oh, and okay. the tiger. All right. Uh, it's it, it, and the tiger has an argument over the with the donkey. Basically, the moral of the story is, you know, don't argue with a fool. Kind of, you know, sometimes. It's it's pretty cool. It's all over Instagram and you know all over the place. You know. All right. Good. I'll look it up. Words of wisdom. All righty. Well, th- thanks for being here. This has been fun. And uh, yeah, it's thanks, it's, yeah. it's really great being out, having a, a group of men talking together. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. It's really a pleasure yeah. having you guys and uh, see you next time. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Alrighty. guys. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.